So um, we're quite fortunate to bring you one of the leading experts and innovators in hearables and wearables, sharing how the next horizon of combining this data with machine learning will shift this market into hyperdrive. Welcome Valen Selzone, Stephen LaBeouf to the stage. All right. Yeah, this, this. Thank you all for your time. You know, when I hear about the smart clothing and all these smart devices and smart appliances, it makes me think about what happens when we get to the singularity and our smart stuff is smarter than we are. I was thinking about, so no joke, y'all, I was in Korea visiting a customer a couple of years ago, uh, maybe a little more than a couple of years ago, and I had way too much coffee before I went to the meeting, and they had to direct me to the, the restroom. Well, I go to this restroom, and there is a toilet, I swear to Jehovah, that had, looked like a cockpit. It had, 14, it had 14 buttons on it. Well, I'm trying to figure this thing out. I'm like, well, how do I even flush this thing? So I'm looking around, and I see this button. I don't know that much Korean. So I'm looking at this button. It's got water on it. Figure that's a universal symbol. So I go to press it. I hear, I'm like, what the hell? Water starts splashing right in my face. And I got a suit on. This is back when I used to wear suits. I was serious back then. And I'm trying to dodge this water thing. This thing is moving around. It's following me. I swear to Jehovah, it's like heat sinking. Follow me. So I, I, I'm going around like this, trying to hit any button I can to shut it off. Finally, I shut it off. I walk out of the door. All the Koreans are laughing their asses off, making fun of me in Korean. Come to find out, this, this, that water button wasn't the flush. It was a bidet. And the bidet thing, little thing that comes out and cleans your butthole, well, it has a sensor on it that sweeps across your butthole, and it thought, the stupid thing thought I was the butthole. So I, maybe, maybe it's a little smarter than we give it credit for. I, I don't know. But now to talk about something much more interesting than buttholes, and that is wearable sensors and machine learning. So uh, Valencell, as many of you know, we, we don't make our own wearable devices. We make sensor technology that goes in those wearable devices. It's very accurate and validated. That's what we do. And to start off this conversation, I want to say this topic is really, we're the perfect company to talk about this because since we don't make those products, but we're so involved in that early R&D, we get to see what's happening. You know, we get to see what's going to happen in the year 25, 25, if man is still alive. And, and so we get, to, we get to see where this is going in machine learning and wearables. We're getting to see a lot farther maybe than some others. So I'm going to start at the beginning, which is where the modern wearables movement started which is with activity trackers. And, and, and we know that's really all they were, is activity trackers. In fact, some of them weren't any more than that at all. At least the Fitbit device counted your steps. The Nike Fuel device didn't even do that. All it told you was, did you move more or move less? But that's all it needed to do for its use case. And it actually succeeded very, very well. In, in the mid-2010s, there was the advent of optical heart rate monitoring using photoplasmography, which is also called PPG because people don't like to say photoplasmography all the time. It's got too many syllables. But it's basically all PPG is, is using light to see changes in scatter, scatter light with blood flow. You see changes in blood flow through changes in light scatter. That's what it's doing. And it's, it, it became the workhorse of all biometric monitoring for, for wearable devices, uh, period. And, and over, over the later 2010s period, other form factors came in, into fruition. Uh, things like, for example, masks uh, to help you with pain. Also, devices that could be used by, uh, by pilots to monitor their blood oxygen levels, patches for medical purposes, but all, so the workhorse of the, the biometric wearables were, was still photoplasmography, this optical heart rate monitoring technology. And so one of the things people ask us a lot about is they say, okay, well, Valencell, for the last 10 years or so, uh, at the heart of biometrics for wearable devices has been optical heart rate monitoring in some way or fashion. So, so you know, what's next? What's the next thing that's com coming down the pipeline? And the reality is for, for the near term, for the next five years, for certain, I think it's still optical heart rate monitoring combined with machine learning. So one of the things that's happened in this past year, an explosion of publications and company reports about using data from existing commercially available devices that have optical heart rate monitoring sensors in them, using that data combined with machine learning to generate uh, new assessments, new use cases, and new metrics. And, and I, what I've done is I put a few examples here to talk about, but there's, of course, many more than this. One of the ones that, of course, has been well popularized and publicized out there is, is, is monitoring atrial fibrillation with these optical heart rate monitors. And that's been shown to, to, to uh, what you can do with a machine learning model applied towards these, these, these consumer-grade uh, optical heart rate monitors. You can, you can actually predict if someone has atrial fib to a really amazing extent, to where uh, you have it so down pat, all you have to do is tell them to take an ECG reading and then get a definitive answer. Now, 
atrial fib is a big problem, but it's also not one that most people have. But one thing that's much more common is, is cardiovascular disease, or CVD. And researchers have shown that with commercially available today, optical heart rate monitors on the wrist, that using that data combined with some user input, they can predict very accurately whether or not you have cardiovascular disease or not. Similarly to the, the questionnaires the doctors give you, plus they do a lipid panel. In this case, you don't have to do the lipid panel. And, and it's still, it, it, I wouldn't say that they've got it all down pat, but the research is really promising. Uh, another one is gas exchange analysis. I remember when valence cell first started, one of the challenges we, we had to figure out how to do is how could we get an accurate assessment of VO2 max, non-invasive or not with a gas exchange analysis device. Now with these machine learning tools, people have shown that they can use this, these optical PPG signals to essentially predict what the gas exchange analysis device would, would, would do throughout the, the whole level of exercise. Another one, cardiomyopathy. This is another one where these researchers, they were using a wrist optical HRM sensor here. They were using that data combined with a machine learning model. In this case, it was a multi-instance machine learning model to predict whether or not you have cardiomyopathy. So, I mean, this is just a few examples. Sleep stage is another thing. Uh, that, for, for a long, for the longest time, the way when people try to use biometric monitors, optical heart rate monitors to, to gauge sleep stage, they were using more classical approaches and, and they couldn't get down to a resolution or rather an accuracy good enough, and precision, accuracy and precision good enough to be clinically useful. But now people have shown you can do that. It's not as good as the benchmark devices, but still clinically useful now with the advent of machine learning applied to, to these technologies. So why now? Why is this happening now? And I think at Valencia, we think there's four big reasons why. The first one is the advent of very extremely highly accurate, validated, very compact, low power optical PPG sensing technologies in the marketplace today. Now, we oftentimes in the industry, we conflate, rightly or wrongly, an optical heart rate monitor with PPG because the reality is that a PPG signal has a lot more information than heart rate. But we combine the two together because that's the primary metric that it generates. But you also generate in these sensors now not just heart rate, but beat to beat interval, blood flow intensity in any given second, in some particular cases, even blood pressure, or at least an indicator for blood pressure, and a variety of other parameters. Respiration rate characteristics come out of these sensors, and sometimes they're, they're output in a serial fashion. So the, the sensors have gotten a whole lot better. Another thing is the scale. I mean, there's over 100 million uh, wearable optical devices in the marketplace today. And so now you have access to these databases where people are generating this content that you can, you can make machine learning models from. If you've ever made a machine learning model, you know they really, really, really love a ton of data. Another thing is the democratization of the machine learning tools. Back when I was a young Chelovic 25 years ago studying machine learning, I gotta say the math has not changed much since then. That's some, in, some improvements, but the math is pretty much the same. The, the, the difference is that now the machine learning tools are so much better. You, you can turn an average machine uh, or an average data scientist to a really good data scientist with these machine learning tools. Things like uh, Python, uh, Python uh, machine learning tools, also uh, Google TensorFlow. I mean, these, it re what, what it does is it does for accounting, what Excel did for accounting is what these tools are doing for, for data science. And then the last thing is, is sense of fusion and data fusion, the fact that, so now let's say you got a bunch of data from people who are wearing these optical, uh, these PPG-based optical heart rate monitors and all the data they're able to generate, but then also these, these sensors, of course, connected to mobile phones and the rest of the world, so you might know what their food diary is said about them, you might know where their environment is said, and you can start to make predictions about what foods are uniquely making them healthier, what environments are uniquely making them uh, less healthy, um, allergic, and I think the confluence of all these four things are really, are, are really why we're seeing this now. Now, uh, the examples I showed you before in the last slide, a lot of those were academic, not all of them, some were, some were reports from, from industry, but I'm al always much more impressed by, you know, in academia, you just gotta publish a paper. When you're, making a, when you're in a commercial world, you gotta make a product, and so one of the companies that's using machine learning and existing wearable data, optical PPG data, towards the end of new assessments is this company called, small company called Cardiogram. And Cardiogram, all, they have this, I, I wanna say it's called Deep Heart, and, and the way it works is it looks at just heart rate data, <coughs> heart rate data, just separate data, combines those together to make these sweeping assessments. One of the things they were able to do with just that data, now it is longitudinal, you have to collect it over a period of time, it's not an instant measurement, but they can tell you whether or not you have atrial fib within a certain degree of accuracy, they can make an assessment as to whether or not you have diabetes within a certain range of accuracy. And so they're get, starting to get traction in the marketplace, especially I wanna say from corporate wellness type organizations. 
Uh, another example of a company, now this company is using heart rate monitoring technology, but they're using an old school technology that they really raised the currency of, and it's a company called AliveCore. And AliveCore, they, are, they were, the, to the best of my knowledge, they were the first company that made a truly um, a portable, mobile uh, device for atrial fib monitoring. They got FDA approval. And one of the more interesting things recently is, is AliveCore developed a model, a machine learning model, to, de to detect with the same technology, so just ECG, whether or not you have hypokalemia, which is an excessive amount of potassium in your blood. It's, it's associated a lot of times with kidney failure, kidney disease. That's an important thing to measure. And they tried to do a classical technique looking at the intensity of the, the T waves in order to make this work. And they couldn't get that to work. I think they got an area under the curve of like 0.63 by memory. And by applying a machine learning model to the like one point something million or two million ECG data sets, they were able to create something like 0.85 or 0.86 area under the curve. So much better. One's clinically useful, one, one is not. At Valence Cell, we went through the same thing. Uh, we, as, as some of y'all know, we have announced our technology, our ability to accurately assess blood pressure with optical PPG, cuff-like. And when we started this research back in the late 2000s, we, we saw you could, you could, that blood flow information did correlate strongly with blood pressure. The problem was every time we tried to make it generalize, it just wouldn't generalize. I mean, the, the, uh, it, it was tied to a person, the transfer function between the person's blood flow and the actual blood pressure changed over time. It was a very nonlinear problem. So we knew we needed to collect a ton of data and do a machine learning model. So our approach was the first thing we had to do, because these data sets weren't available, we, there was no big database of reflection mode PPG data and labeled BP data for us to pick from. We had to collect all this data ourselves. So we collected over 15,000 data sets, 15,000 sessions, and over 5,000 people in malls in the United States. We went to the Philippines and Vietnam because we needed to make sure the model would work across multiple ethnicities. And we got a ton of data, and we built this model, and we, we generated a machine learning model to connect the dots between a PPG signal, a 30-second PPG signal and blood pressure, and we liked our results. But the problem is, in machine learning, you have to test this out on data you haven't used to build the model. So we had to collect another data set. So we collected a data set according to the ISO 8160 uh, protocol for, for non-invasive blood pressure cuffs. So we said, okay, let's see how well we do in comparison to a blood pressure cuff with the ground truth being and a sculptatory measurement or a manual measurement by a person. So we followed that protocol. We hired a bunch of nurses to do this for us. We collected hundreds of data sets. And after we'd done this, we indeed got cuff-like performance. If you want to check it out, we even demoed it at the booth. This, this earbud on the right uh, is, is an embedded solution for measuring your blood pressure with an audio earbud that also tracks your blood pressure with our optical PPG sensor technology. We demoed it at the booth. We'll show you all the data from it. And so we, we had to use that approach. And so what, to make a short story long, what I'm trying to say here is that when you look at the future of wearables, it's not going to be so much about new sensor modalities, though I don't discount that. I mean, there are some cool sensor modalities out there, but you're going to see a lot more interesting things from some old school sensor modalities where the, sp the special sauce is the, the data sets collected and the machine learning around it. Thanks for your time. Y'all have a good one.